I'm joined, obviously, as we see, by Samra Cherry, who is a long-time journalist who's worked across different newspapers in India and also is the president of INCO. Now, for those who are not aware of the INCO brand, it is the International Network of Nicotine Consumer Organisations. Bit of a mouthful, but it's much easier to say INCO. So, Samra, welcome. Now, my first question really is about some of the points that you touched on in your presentation. How... How do we advocate really the, the harm reduction on these alternative products, alternative um, you know, pro nicotine products, to encourage like national governments, state governments, um, for harm reduction policy making or harm reduction based, evidence based policy making? Well, see, uh, uh, what we do can also vary in which country we are in. Hmm. So, uh, for example, in the West, there is, I feel, generally more value or uh, more power to the individual which doesn't translate uh, uh, as well when you come to LMICs or Asian nations, where uh, your individual voice doesn't matter so much. So therefore, it becomes important that we organize, uh, we speak in collective voices. Uh, when there is a huge pushback, you know, I mean, of course, you know, one thing that we have going for us is that the science and the evidence are on our side. So we, we have a lot of credible science going. Of course, there is obfuscation and they would like to uh, you know, uh, exaggerate some risks and not compare them to uh, the substitution that we are talking about. So it's good to counter that uh, with the evidence. Uh, also reach out to your uh, public health professionals. Well, see, I, what I have from my experience found that people who work in tobacco control, the public health professionals working there, uh, they seem to be working more on ideology rather than evidence. And I think it's group think which has gotten the better of them. But that said, there are also a lot of other public health officials who are uh, not as connected to tobacco control or not uh, taken in by the ideology. And they are open sometimes to listen to you, uh, see the evidence, see the science, see where, uh, uh, how uh, the policies have uh, positively impacted in some other countries and are willing to take it up. So I think uh, engagement has to be at various levels and also particular to your country uh, and what kind of a setup there is. Yeah, yeah. well, in terms of the, the work that is done, I, I mean, you've seen some of the recent statements um, regarding banning um, these products. What, what, what is your response to these statements in, you know, particularly um, lower income countries? Yeah, how do we fight against this? Well, you know, uh, what I find uh, really strange is that we are talking about equality everywhere. Right? We're talking about racial equality. We're talking about gender equality. We're also talking about regional equality. So in, in, in a world like that, someone makes a statement so uh, discriminatory and it, uh, uh, it's more or less accepted by some of these countries, you know, uh, which, which are impacted. Mm -hmm. So I find that really ridiculous and out of sync with global thinking. That said, it's also uh, it's an impractical idea. And in fact, uh, tobacco harm reduction in a country or in countries where people have less access to public health care or are less uh, equipped to deal with the consequences of tobacco use. In a situation like that, it would be more uh, useful that these people could proactively uh, do something about the risk that you know tobacco use is putting them at. So it is discriminatory. I hope governments look, see it that way. Uh, and do not uh, fall into this uh, trap of, oh, we are not equipped to deal with this, so it's better to ban. Because bans are also leading to black markets. And we have seen this in Thailand, we've seen this in Mexico, we've seen this in Brazil, that bans don't actually uh, impact availability of these products. What they do is they push them in a black market where there is even less uh, checks and balances for unintended use. Yeah. And... I was very interested in your, uh, as we talked earlier with Clive Bates, uh, talking about the FCTC and particularly it's of interest that in those some of those countries, the FCTC countries, as you pointed out, they, they are very strong producers of smokes, of cigarettes, and that they may maintain strong commercial stakes in the industry. I mean, and we, we talked earlier to people from um, India, uh, Thailand, you know, consumer advocates, how, how do we best get government to see that really that they, you know, that consumers, particularly people who are smoking, actually do want to change out of those high risk products for their own sake and go to 
uh, nicotine, you know, nicotine products. So they, so they don't need the tobacco, they need the nicotine. How, how do we convince governments, particularly when they've got a stake like that? Well, see, there is, it is obviously problematic and there's a huge conflict of interest there because the government is responsible to the people and the overall health of the people. Whereas the tobacco companies themselves are selling products which are, you know, are, are leading to a lot of uh, preventable deaths. But, you know, uh, tobacco harm reduction works for both, you know, for a company, because like you said, uh, any smoker, if you give him an option that, okay, here's an, here's an effective means to reduce risk to yourself, would, if it was affordable and came in uh, uh, variants that the person that fits the person's lifestyle would make a switch. So there's a, there's a huge consumer demand and it's going to grow over the, as people become more and more aware that yes, this option exists. So the consumer demand is going to grow. And if these SOTCs, state-owned tobacco companies, don't innovate, then in 10 years, they will be really out of sync with, with consumer demand. So it's also in their interest to make a switch. It's obviously in the interest of the government because uh, while a lot of money is linked to tobacco taxes, the governments end up paying or losing a lot more in uh, tobacco morbidity and mortality costs. So it also does not make economic sense. So I I, uh, I hope this, I mean, both realize that it is in their interest to move with the times to let technology, the way it's reshaping every other industry, also work wonders in this one. And, and that's something which, um, moving on uh, exactly to that point, is really what kind of arguments and, and, and mechanisms or even actions were, are possible to defend this harm reduction in, you would say, democratically fragile or, or you know, um, so kind of socially hostile environments or environments where there's such low incomes that um, it's not the first concern for governments or even for some communities. So, you know, how, how what are some of the mechanisms or actions, or arguments that we might use? Well, see, I, uh, first of all, it would be wrong uh, if it is not a primary concern for the government. Because, uh, you know, in my talk, I did point out that uh, smoking or tobacco use is also economically linked. You know, the poorer the mm -hmm. countries are, they have really high uh, smoking or tobacco use rates. I can tell you in India, there are 270 million people who use tobacco products. And, you know, it's it, it's linked to over 1.3 million deaths annually. So, and, and these are just deaths. We have, you know, there's also uh, cost of mm -hmm. treatment and loss productivity. So uh, it should be on top of everyone, everyone's agenda, especially in lower uh, middle income countries where uh, the issue is bigger. Uh, and then it, you know, it purely, you know, you can make this argument both from the health and the economic point, because, you know, the better health of people means you have more people working. It's also uh, going to save the governments more money over a period of time. So it should become part of uh, or a bigger part of policy making. If there is corruption, then there is little, uh, you know, uh, it's not it's not uh, serving the public interest and it should be spoken up against and it should be pointed out at every turn. Mm. And this is something I, mean, I know that a lot of um, advocates across the region have those challenges that even within their own countries, like we alluded to earlier, there are different groups, particularly uh, even in countries such as uh, Australia and New Zealand, where we find that there are some dramatically uh, you would say low socioeconomic groups and um, groups with low health outcomes and uh, particularly indigenous groups and others who for you know for a lot of reasons actually can't access um, standard uh, quit tobacco techniques and so for them um, illegal products are generally readily available and the easiest to get and, and often the public health message doesn't work whatsoever so so that is a very good point now just to finish up um, Samrat uh, what strategies can you suggest to get uh, consumers engaged in this advocacy and, and, and why is it really important that they get involved? Well, uh, I touched upon a few points in my talk and I, and I want to make a few additional points to that. Mm. So one is that it does affect, it's a life and death thing for a lot of smokers who have switched to these products because uh, we know this and we are seeing this in India. Uh, you know, vapors who did transition, you know, from smoking to vaping, because of the ban, the ban are being pushed back to smoking. Now uh, that is that is the worst outcome of a ban. Mm. For people who continue to smoke, they are facing much much greater risks. 
so at an individual level it matters to a lot of people and you know that is why i think uh, a lot of vapers are also vaping advocates you know we, you wouldn't see that with smokers you, we never had a situation where there was a tobacco or a smokers group which was fighting for their rights or which was talking about human rights which was uh, talking about the right to choice so it is important at an individual level it is also important uh, at a public level because uh, you know vaping also is not just reducing harm to those individuals but also to their near ones so since i switched from smoking to vaping my family is the happiest because they are not being put through uh, uh, the smoking harm that they were earlier so uh, you know i i recently uh, read a, uh, a study that kids who are near uh, people who smoke are being hospitalized more often with vaping that harm that unintended harm or that uh, to non smokers also gets reduced a lot so it's it's about you it's about your family uh, it's also generally about the health of your nation so i do understand that uh, a lot of uh, vapers and especially uh, vapers uh, vapers don't feel that they need to be involved the way around that is to involve them in small things or ready or small actions you know so it's a step by thing because also uh, like someone pointed out in a earlier talk that we need to parse scientific data in ways that vapers understand and communicate to others so a lot is to be done and i see uh, a movement is growing lot and lot more people are getting involved every day and i mm. hope it continues to go that way